Anytime you word, use the word try, it's an indicator that you're in the flesh. Uh, this is all going together with what we're talking about in Romans. And uh, boy, I tell you, I have been convicted in my Christian life about how often I do things in the flesh, in my own strength. And God has given us clear teaching that it's not our strength at all. We don't try. We can't labor. It's about rest and yielding and walking in obedience to the Holy Spirit that brings about those things in our life that we want to see. And so that's really where we are today in this. Now, I think it's good for us to study what gentleness looks like, what goodness is, so that we can identify in our lives things uh, where, the, where the Lord is working, the Holy Spirit is, is giving us that fruit. If it's not, we want to see the lack of that and, and uh, understand that there's a problem then, and so we can look through that. So let's look into this idea of goodness and gentleness today. And um, I'd like to look, um, I'll read again the, the fruit of the Spirit here. We've talked about over and over again, but we've understood here that this gentleness and goodness are the fifth and sixth fruit of the, of the Spirit here. And again, some people have said that the order of the fruit of the Spirit is significant. Uh, I've read others that say it's not that significant, it's just kind of there. I don't have an opinion about it, so I'm not saying that this is in order of importance, but I believe today that as we look at this, you'll see how important it is in our lives. I think every one of them are important, and it's something that we need to add in to our lives on a daily basis uh, through the Holy Spirit. But Ephesians chapter 5, would you turn there very quickly with me? No, you have it in your notes, don't you? Yes, never mind. So, um, I mean, you're welcome to turn there, but uh, look at Ephesians 5, 8 through 10. For ye were sometimes darkness. Um, can I just point out here before we go any further, it doesn't say that you were sometimes in darkness. Isn't that interesting? If we were in darkness, that means we would be maybe swallowed up in it or we would be in the midst of it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we are a part of it or that's our character. But as it says we were sometimes darkness, that means you were, you and I at one point were part of that darkness. We were contributing to it, all right? But notice it says there in verse number uh, eight, but now are ye light in the Lord, all right? So what we're talking about here is not a position, it is a character change. It is you were darkness, now you're light. That's very important, but then we go on. Walk then as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And so we have here this idea of gentleness, first of all. Number one, in your notes there, you can put down gentleness. Let me just say, um, years ago in uh, 1988, some of you think that's ancient, uh, but it actually wasn't that long ago. Uh, after receiving his party's nomination, President Herbert uh, Walker Bush, right? George Herbert Walker Bush, yeah, okay. H.W. is what I'm thinking. He, in, in, his, in his speech, he called for a kinder, uh, no, kinder and gentler nation. Didn't he? Didn't he? Now, now, how many of us would uh, understand today uh, that we have a kinder and gentler, kinder and gentler nation, right? No, not even close. We've gone the opposite direction, haven't we? Now, it's, it's striking to me as we think about this. Since that time, things have only gotten worse. And here's the reason why. Humanity as a whole is incapable of accomplishing what needs to be done. People know that kind and gentle are good things. Matter of fact, today we see that, don't we? I mentioned that already. You see a lot of uh, newscasts. They're like, uh, you know, here's all the bad news. And then at the end, here's some good news. And somebody did something kind today, you know. And that's great and good. But the fact of the matter is, as a whole, humanity is incapable of governing himself without God. Society collapses under humanism and secularism. Humanism is that exaltation and that stressing of the potential and the goodness of humanity and the human life and the human, all of this. Let me tell you, there can be nothing opposed to Scripture more than that. There is nothing good in humans. You say, well, I know some good people. I'm not saying the humans can't do good things, but I'm saying there's no lasting fruit from that goodness. 
And as a matter of fact, I think most of the goodness that humanity produces in the flesh is actually self-promoting. Again, I'm not the expert judge on all that, but I just see that there can be nothing good in humanity apart from God. And so when, humanism, when humans stress the potential value and goodness of human beings, and by the way, we are seeing that today in huge numbers, right? We're stressing mankind is essentially good. We can solve our problems. We can do what we need to do. And all the while, separating themselves from that which is really sacred and and righteous, what we're seeing is the very undoing of our society because of mankind's failure in themselves. Secularism is similarly defined as the indifference or rejection or exclusion of religion and religious considerations. And I'm not talking just widely religion in general. I'm talking about Scripture and Bible Christianity. Um, Going on, President Obama, back um, under his leadership, said that the United States was a better place and that race relations were also better. Interesting, isn't it? Of course, this wasn't true. Cities were burned back then by race-driven riots. Um, anarchists, violence of every sort raged in cities to the point that Hillary Clinton called for, on her presidential campaign, called for the need for a mandatory gun buyback because of all the violence. And what I'm saying is that we are not kinder and and gentler. (laughs) That's a hard one to say. We are not better, and we'll never get better, in our own hands. The answer for our world is the Lord Jesus Christ. It is authentic and genuine relation to him. Now, Jesus was clear about the last days and the things that would come about, and humanism and secularism are really the epitomes of failure and ultimate demise of human structures. Um, Matthew 10, 33 to 34, I think, points this out very clearly. When Jesus said, Whosoever shall deny me before men... Him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Now, you say, I thought he was the Prince of Peace. Well, he is to those who receive him. And it's the complete opposite from those who reject him. Those who reject him get nothing but failure and destruction. So, regardless, though, of the world's tendencies and the way that the world is going, we're not living in a kinder and gentler society. We're not living in a society that is better than it was before. But regardless of that, Christian, here's the good news. We can live as a gentle and kind person. Not that we manufacture this, because you're not going to have any more success than the world does in your flesh. But we can have that if we are walking in the Spirit. And that's what God is calling us to. And so we look at gentleness here. And when we think of gentleness, what comes to mind? Can you give me your first thought when it comes to gentleness? Let's do a quick association game here, all right? Gentle. Somebody shout something out. Mother. Mother. Okay, good. Wow, nobody has any gentle ideas, huh? Uh, Soft-spoken, all right? What about a picture or an animal or a scene? or what, What do you think? Gentle. A lamb. Okay, right, good. What is it? A breeze. All right, good. This is good. Huh? Easy, girls. Okay. Stream. Okay, a lake, a calm lake, right? All right. Some people think of, you know, older people or gentle, you know, ponies. I don't know. Are ponies gentle, I guess? (laughs) This is why you don't say anything out loud, right? (laughs) Because so we have here, you know, lots of different pictures of gentleness, right? Um, and let me just give you, if I can, some thoughts here about this. As, as a fruit of the Spirit, gentleness is obviously something that we want to understand and study. It comes from the Greek word that means tender-heartedness, kindness, graciousness. Um, it, it is a part of <clears throat> what we might consider to be someone who is Easy to be entreated. Now, that's kind of a concept we don't use a whole lot in our modern American vernacular. But let me just tell you what that means. 
someone who is easy to be entreated means they could be approached without feeling threatened. You don't feel threatened going to them, approaching them. Um, you know that boss or even parent, perhaps, or relative or neighbor or authority in some way that you know from experience that if I go and talk to that person, bring up some sort of concern or need or problem, it's not going to go that well. It's probably going to come back on me or it's going to be dismissed or whatever. That person, we would say, is not easy to be entreated, all right? But on the contrary, someone who's easy to be entreated, uh, entreated listens, receives, um, maybe counsels or sympathizes or whatever the case might be. So the, the difference there, I think, is clear, though we may not understand the word. So gentleness is what we're talking about. Now, the Greek's definition of gentleness was power under control. All right, now we use that sometimes to talk about meekness. Uh, but the idea is the picture that they would use is of this big, huge, strong horse. But that horse was, we might say, trained or disciplined to where it could be comfortable in any condition. Um, um, it, we were down yesterday and, and the day before um, speaking at a, at a uh, couple's get together and um, it was in Amish country and they have these massive horses for pulling their plows, right? Now they have other horses for pulling their carriages, but these massive horses, and there were some in the pasture right beside us there. And it's just amazing to me to think of these huge horses that are capable of pulling thousands of pounds and you know doing all kinds of damage. And yet here's one little man can walk up to that horse, put on a bridle and a bit, and strap on all of these things and tell that horse what to do in the minutest details to get those straight lines. It's pretty amazing to me, isn't it? I mean, even if you take one of the horses that pull the, the carriages, um, you know, you think about what that horse has to be able to do in every given situation and the strength that that horse has and, and the ability to control that thing is just amazing to me. And that's what we're talking about here. The picture of gentleness, it's like this ability and strength and, and maybe authority and power and, and right and all this, but it's all held under control. And so that's the picture that we're getting here, power in check. And so we might say it is a strong hard hand with a soft touch. And that's what we're talking about gentleness here. Uh, the idea of something strong and big, but yet it's not destructive, it's not hurtful, it can be even helpful. So let's talk about a couple of these uh, aspects of gentleness here. You've got them in your notes. Number one, or letter A there, tenderheartedness. We've mentioned this here. Uh, but tenderheartedness, you have a couple of the definitions. Sympathy or sympathetic, careful, considerate, polite, All right, so um, let me just get some feedback here from you here this morning. Uh, we're in a grocery store, and we're in the checkout line, all right? And the lady that's the, the checkout lady, the cashier, she has, is having some problems scanning this, this item. And uh, there's a line behind you, and you're in line. You're the one that, ha you know, it's your product that, that um, she has to scan, having trouble, and she has to call a manager. You know what happens, right? You know, you start feeling the pressure of everybody behind you, and they might even be rude or whatever. Um, what, what, are, what would be some of the responses uh, that, that we might have a tendency to make in that situation toward that cashier? Help me out here. Impatient, right? Frustration. What are some phrases that we might say? Is this confession today? I don't. I don't want this to be confession. They ought to have a special line. They ought to have a special line. Okay. Well, you know, can't you? Whatever. I don't know. What? Technology never works, right? Um, man, I tell you that I'm in such a hurry. I can't believe this. And, and you know, in the flesh, we would feel like that, wouldn't we? Um, I, I won't give the personal <laughs> detail. Um, story. Well, it's actually not about me, <laughs> so that's why I can't do it. But anyway, um, but there are people who are very impatient out there. I'll, I'll give this one. Uh, last week, I was, 
My wife and I were in Lowe's, actually heading into Lowe's, and before we got the car parked, there was a car that pulled behind us and it was trying to turn right and there was a big line to get loaded up in the, in the whatever parking lot there. And I mean, this guy was laying on, it was an older guy, laying on his horn, yelling profanities, I mean, in the middle of this parking lot. And I mean, the guy in front of him couldn't go anywhere. And he's yelling and screaming and my wife's walking by and I mean, it's really unbelievable. Okay, so that's before I even got out of the car. Finally, he gets out and goes around. Now I'm walking into the store. Someone's pulling the wrong way down here. And evidently somebody told him he couldn't do that. Well, they start screaming at one another like you wouldn't believe. Cussing, swearing, profanities. I mean, unbelievable. I, heard, I went to hurry up there. Hopefully I'd intervene or something. I don't know. But by the time I got up there, he was around, and then, and then we got inside, and there was a third ep uh, uh, um, episode of someone who was very impatient. I'm telling you, it just made me feel like I can't go anywhere. Now, the point I'm trying to make is that, yeah, th that unsaved and all that, but here's the problem. When Christians reflect that sort of a spirit, all we're doing is showing how much like the world we are. And so it's not like, oh, I better keep my mouth quiet. It's the Holy Spirit that we are walking in His power and He allows us to do things that otherwise would be impossible or anti what normally we would do. And we could live in a way that is gentle, that is tenderhearted. So the idea is considerate, polite. So in that situation, when I'm at that counter and I may be feeling like, I wish they'd get their act together here. What I could say is something like, the Holy Spirit's prompting me, right? Man, I'm sorry about this. I understand that things don't go right all the time. Can I do anything to help? You want me to run back there and get that for you? I'm in no hurry, no problem. What I'm saying is, being kind and gentle is a fruit of the Spirit. We, we overlook that as that's not my personality or they should have it you know, put together and they, whatever, whatever. The point is, the Holy Spirit's leading us. What is He bringing forth in our hearts and our lives. I think impatience is a sign that the Holy Spirit is not in control of your life at that point in time. Acutely sensitive to the feelings of those with whom you're conversing, compassionate. Number two, or letter B here, you know, it's kindness. Uh, a little bit of an overlap here, but manners that manifest themselves in generosity and encouragement. So manners, that is, our interaction with other people that show themselves in generosity and encouragement. Again, go back to standing in the line at the grocery counter, and kindness can play a huge part of the spirit of that interaction. But we must be led by the spirit in order for that to happen. Number two, or number three, graciousness. Graciousness. Graciousness is the fact of being able to show courtesy, charm, and politeness. Having pleasing qualities that others find socially attractive. Are you able to be in a group or in a hard situation and instead of getting agitated and getting turned inside out and upside down, are you able to bring a peace and a calm to that situation? When I mean you, I mean the Holy Spirit working through you. That's what we're talking about, graciousness. It's the, the, the tendency not to get uptight and unwound in a certain situation. All right, and then let me give you letter D here. Easy to be entreated. And we talked about this, and I won't spend a lot of time. That means to be easy to talk to about problems or needs. It implies that one is approachable because of a humble and loving spirit. No one likes to be around a know-it-all or always right kind of a person, right? Every Christian ought to be gentle enough to be approachable by almost anyone. And that's what we find in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. And um, I want to just um, maybe have you turn in your Bibles there. You don't have it in your notes. So if you'll turn to Ephesians 4, 30. And notice... What it is that is our potential as we walk in the Spirit? Notice uh, verse 30. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. And then notice what will be a result of that. Let all 
bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And we know this verse, don't we? Be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love, chapter 5, verse 1 says. As Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. And so the, the idea here is that we have the quality and the ability to be gentle in any given situation and kind by the Holy Spirit's help. It's, uh, there's an illustration of a, a lady who her kids rode the bus and uh, they won some goldfish for a promotion. We've had our share of that. And uh, so the goldfish came home and mom needed a tank to put them in. So she went down to the store and didn't have anything. They're all too expensive. But the guy said, well, I've got an old used one in the back. And he went and brought this filthy used tank. So I'll give it to you for a dollar. Mom, mom said, I'll take it. So she took it home, got the soap out and the water. And I mean, she scrubbed that thing clean, put the fish in it. Well, it wasn't about a day or two later, the first fish died. I think they're engineered that way. Maybe not. But anyway, so then the second fish died, and so she called the place where she bought the tank. What happened? I don't know. Fish are dying. What did you do when you got the tank home? Well, I washed it out. What did you use? So that soap, the residual soap in there is killing your fish. So what she intended to do to be good and helpful ended up being hurtful. And isn't that the way it happens in our lives as Christians? Sometimes our intentions are good, and we try really hard but even our best intentions ends up doing a lot of damage. And that's, I think, the characteristic of our flesh. When we do it in the flesh, we're going to bring more damage than help. God intends for us to be people that are led by the Spirit. And when we're in the Spirit, we will not do damage. We will, we will do benefit to the work of God. You know the kind of people that are the, you know, just get it done Christians. Let's just get in and get it done. And, and I'm, I'm not saying zeal is wrong. Matter of fact, I believe there's a certain element of zeal that we need to have. But let me tell you, sometimes we can do a lot of damage to the work of God just because our zeal is earnest. We're not to just do the work of God. We're to be filled with the Spirit and to walk in His power. And let me tell you, when, when that is the case, earnest zeal will be one of the effects of that. But we find that these uh, often bring a lot of damage in our lives. The lack of gentleness is like that killer soap in the fish tank. Intentions may be good, but the soap is harsh and dangerous. Um, all right, let's go on. Um, let, me, let me go, if I can, now to um, Number two, before I give you number two, though, let me just give you this thought. How do we respond to people who are not gentle? Right, let's, go, let's go back to the illustration in the grocery store, and the person behind us is being very unkind. You ever had that experience? Were you ever that person? <laughs> Hopefully not. But the person behind us is being unkind, uh, maybe pushy, being a little bit unreasonable. How do you respond to that? Well, the answer is, in the power of the Holy Spirit, we respond in the way that we ought to, the way that is gentle, kind, easy to be entreated. So we don't respond with the same attitude. We know the principles in the Bible, right? Uh, don't return evil for evil. Don't, don't heap on more problems. What we need to do is a soft answer, turn away wrath. Now, is that easy to do when someone's being unreasonable to you? Or unkind? No, it's hard. But the fact is, we are living a life that is not only hard, it's impossible to live outside of the power of the Holy Spirit. What I'm emphasizing is, walk in the Spirit. And that's, it's important. You say, what I do at the store and what I say to that person and the attitude that I project to that person is important. I'll tell you, it is of supreme importance. And if we fail in that moment, we might have failed to bring the light of the gospel to that person. Well, I don't know what the Lord's doing. I'll give you the illustration. I gave it a while back, but last summer I was pulling into the bank up on Rockside Road. I never go to that bank. I happened to be there. I needed to go in, so I pulled into my bank on Rockside Road. And 
I pulled in, but I had missed the parking space a little bit, so I was backing out. A lady was pulling in behind me, and I saw her, and so I stopped, still had my car in reverse, and uh, she starts laying on the horn and will not stop. I mean, I'm going and going and going. And I rolled my window down, and I kind of peeked over, and I waved at her, I see you. So she waved, she stayed, and I pulled in, pulled up there, and she pulls next to me. And I think to myself, this may not be good. <laughs> so I, I get out, and I walk around, and I kind of wave at her and smile, and I say, hey, I saw you. I wasn't going to hit you. And uh, she kind of gives me this uh, idea, you know, I didn't, I didn't know if you saw me, and she's irate. And then all of a sudden, I said, well, I'm really sorry. I didn't, you know, I didn't mean to scare you. And she, all of a sudden, begins weeping uncontrollably. And I mean, she goes into this problem of her life. Her husband's in bad shape and all of these things are going wrong and she can't, doesn't know if she has enough money for this or that. And I mean, she is just going on and on about her life and right then just breaking down in that parking lot. I had no idea what was going on in her life. And it would have been very easy for me in my flesh to tell her exactly how I thought and how I felt. Have you ever been there? But in that moment, I was able to share with her the fact that Jesus loves her. I gave her a track, told her I could, I'd pray with her, and then she got kind of suspicious of me and uh, uh, kind of calmed down. But I was able to give her the gospel. And as I did, I walk away. I don't know what the Lord did in that lady's life, but I know I could have ruined it really easily. So I was not in the wrong. But you never know what people are going through. My wife standing yesterday in the store, and the lady was being a little unreasonable. You know, you're too close to me. Step back with your cart. Step back a little further. Now step back a little further. Literally, I mean, that's what she was saying. My wife's thinking to herself, you know, in the flesh, listen, lady, but then the Holy Spirit told her something. Don't you love the Holy Spirit? Walk in the Spirit. She told me that. She said, the Holy Spirit told me that lady's afraid, and all she knows is what she's doing. And immediately, my wife's testimony is my spirit changed. And I became gentle. Soft answer. I don't know what that interaction would have done in eternity, but I'm telling you this. We so often hinder the work of the Holy Spirit. We quench the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and we walk in the flesh, and instead of fulfilling the will of God, in that moment, in interaction, we're doing what we do in the flesh. And we're walking around doing more damage like that soap in the fish tank. We think we're Christians and we're cleaning up this world. Really what we are is we're the poison doing all the damage. See, a church that's walking in the Spirit and a Christian who's walking in the Spirit has the power of God that can change someone's life. It's not us. It's the power of God in us. But when we're walking in the flesh, we undo, and I think even do more damage than an unsaved person who walks in the flesh because we're the one that's supposed to be the light. And so the gentleness, the goodness aspect here. Let's go on. Number two, uh, goodness. And that's uh, where we'll... um, We've got to quickly finish up here. <clears throat> All right, um, goodness here, number two, Ecclesiastes 7.20. Let me just read this to you. Um, For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. So can we do good in the, in the flesh? And I, I would say, okay, in the human aspect or the human judgment, can we do good? The answer is, you know, I can do good to someone in the flesh. I mean, my unsaved neighbor does good to me. He loans me his tools and all these things. But I'll tell you, in the scope of eternity, for, for really eternity's sake, we cannot do good for eternity's sake. In other words, there is no eternal good that can happen in our lives in the flesh. And so, what we're going to look at this morning in goodness is this idea of um, doing good and the eternal results of that, what it results in our lives. While a sinner is certainly capable of doing some good works, he's not equipped to do eternal good works or the works that last for eternity. God does not look down on the sinner as being good. All right, so in the sense of my, you know, my goodness in the flesh, God doesn't look down and say, wow, that's good. Humans look at it and say it's good, but God doesn't look at that and say it's good. So that's the, that's the difference in our lives. Can I be good to human uh, interactions? Yes, but, but does God see me as good? The answer is no. 
And so goodness is something that we need to uh, quantify in the sense of what God would say. The sinner's character is bound by his sin nature. It affects both his outlook and his philosophy. And I would go back and say this, that even the goodness of man generally has some sort of motive behind it. I didn't mean by that, not good motive. Maybe proud. Uh, for instance, um, the idea is, I'll do good for you, you do good for me, we scratch each other's back. Right? I mean, that's what it is. And that's really, a lot of times when somebody does something good for me, that's what they say. Well, you've done this for me. Or, you know, I know in the future you'll let me whatever. Right? Now let me ask you, is that really goodness? No. It's not goodness. I mean, it's being fair. Hey, Moody's. How are y'all? Yeah, good to see you guys. Uh, you guys have met the Moody's before, I think, but... Uh, can I stop for a minute? Brent was my room captain my first semester in college. Taught me how to cut hair. Brent, I'll be forever grateful. Good to see you today. And Brother Moody, Pastor Moody, and Mrs. Moody, God bless you guys. Good to see you. They're weary journey travelers. Not done yet either today, are you? <laughs> well, rest and have a good morning here, all right? <laughs> All right, so anyway, we're talking this morning about goodness and gentleness as the fruit of the Spirit. And uh, so getting back to this, so the idea there is that goodness in our flesh is really not goodness at all. It's really just pride or selfishness. Isn't that weird? How that something good can be turned on its head, and really our flesh does that many times. What we think is good is really selfishness. And really only when we're walking in the Spirit can we truly have the goodness that God recognizes or that God is, all right? And what is that goodness? That goodness is a goodness that is given without cost or without demand, without some sort of devious motive or pride that's behind it. That's something only God can give. That's something only the Holy Spirit can do. And so we're not, in, a, in our humanity, we're not equipped to do that. Everything is about selfishness and self-seeking. Even my goodness towards others can be selfish. And so the goodness that God grants us through the fruit of the Spirit is manifested through us, but it's His. Let me tell you, is God's goodness ever with some uh, motive or some devious plan? No, it's always just given, right? It's just freely given. We know that from salvation. The Bible says God so loved the world that he gave. It's, there's no cost. There's no ex, uh, expectation of return. It is completely free. That's grace. And so the goodness that we have through the Holy Spirit is God's goodness through us. And that's what makes all the difference. It's not our goodness given to someone else because that's usually, and I would say, I'm going to step out on a limb here and say 100% of the time it's selfish or pride or has some other agenda behind it. God's goodness has none of that. And so that's what he wants to do in our lives. The word goodness comes from the word uh, in, in the Greek that we understand from that day, meaning totally equipped to carry out good works, usefulness. Um, the motivation behind goodness is not found in some sort of, I need, I need something so I'm going to do something. Uh, it's completely unselfish. Um, a person who wants something from you and suggests you owe it to me or in some way, you know, this is a mutual thing is not good. That's not goodness. That's equality, fairness, but it's not goodness. Goodness is completely without um, motive, ulterior motive. Let me give you a couple of these here. I'm kind of getting in my next thoughts here. So goodness, the characteristics of goodness, letter A, has no ulterior motives has no ulterior motives. Um, that's why this lady I was talking about in the bank line or in the bank parking lot, all of a sudden it dawned on her, I'm talking to this complete stranger and he's being so kind, I all of a sudden am very suspicious. And she told me so. I don't think you are who you say you are. Because <laughs> I told her I was a pastor and I'd be happy to pray with her. I don't think you are who you say you are. I had a suit and tie on, so I went back, got a track, <laughs> Hand it to her, here's my name, here's our church. You can look it up. Looking at me like this. Why? Because you're not acting the way that you're supposed to be acting right now. So you must have something that you're trying to get from me. Isn't that the way people think? 
It's so sad. But I mean, you show them the love of God, true kindness, true gentleness and goodness. Whoa. <laughs> I can't accept that. Because everybody has an agenda. Everybody has an angle, right? Everybody's got some motive that they're trying to get. That's why you've got to be careful. You know, you go, you get a phone call. Hey, we want to help you out. We, you won this. Yeah, right. Give me the fine print, right? I've heard this before. Because all goodness in the world's eyes is nothing more than I'm trying to get something from you. And so the the goodness of God that he wants to put through us has no ulterior motives. Number two, it demands no loyalties. That means it doesn't hold an account. Remember I loaned you that four years ago? Yeah, well, uh, you owe it back, right? Or now you owe me. It doesn't demand any loyalties. Or I did this for you and I can't believe you did this to me. Right? That's human goodness, but that's not God's goodness. So there's no loyalties demanded. Number three, it demands no future paybacks. And I guess this is kind of a crossover. I, I kind of crossed into this one too. And so the idea of, of man's goodness is always, I need something in return. You owe me something. Um, you owe me your loyalty. I thought we were best friends. Whatever. Okay, that's not God's goodness. The goodness of God is manifested in a couple ways. And I'm just going to give you a couple of these things. All right, let me ask you this. Are these listed? No. Okay, so let me ask you, what are, what are some ways the goodness of God is manifested generally in our lives and in the lives of others? Through our what? Think about it for a minute. Actions. Very good. Um, and that's kind of a general thing, right? Um, let's just be, let's be maybe a little more specific. That's exactly right. Uh, what about our speech, our words? So if you're going to write this down, number one, you can say your words. That's good. Brother Mark, you were going to say something. Okay, good. Um, let's just write these down. The, the, the sense of which we bring a presence to the room, right? Our, our countenance, our attitude. Um, so the, these are all ways that the goodness of God is seen. Anybody else? These are good. How else do you show the goodness of God? Okay, good. So, so even in the way we think about other people, right? Isn't that true? I mean, truly when God is leading us, the thoughts that we have toward other people will be good. It's not just our actions, but it comes from our heart. That's good. Brother Doug? Yeah, that's good. So just that recognition or that, that respect that we have to other people, if you might say that, esteeming them better than ourselves, uh, boy, that's so important. And that, I think, again, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak it, the issues of life come from our heart. So what you think and feel about other people, and where does that come from? Does that come from ourself? No, that comes from the Holy Spirit doing His work as we walk in Him. That's the goodness of God through the fruit of the Spirit. Any others? All right, I'll give you a couple more. The goodness of God is seen in our generosity. Um, someone said that giving is the language of love. And I think that's really what we could say about goodness. Goodness is giving um, out of a heart of love. So it's uh, an aspect of it. Um, aiding, all right, coming to the help of someone. Well, what can they do for me? Or I don't know, you know. No, goodness is just aiding, helping. No, I don't need any appreciation. I don't need any return. I'm not looking for something back. Just going to help. Wow, that's something, isn't it? All right. So goodness here is, as we, as we finish up this morning, it's not an abstract idea. It's not some theoretical kind of attitude that we're supposed to have. There are some boots on the ground things that we see as a person's walking in the Spirit that they are truly good. It's brought about by a f the fruit of the Spirit which manifests itself in our outward actions. It inevitably holds hands with uh, unexpected uh, personal return. Um, in other words, we, we often get this idea that um, I, I'm, I'm going to be serving, but there's nothing in it for me. But let me tell you, it, it, God always makes sure that what we sow, we reap. And I believe that's true even in the fruit of the Spirit. Um, if a believer's having trouble being gentle or good, the problem is not that you need to determine more to do it, or I need someone to teach me how to do it more. 
What we need is to be walking in the Spirit so that the fruit of goodness and gentleness will be seen in our lives. How many believe this morning then that authentic fruit is much better than artificial fruit? Yeah. Now, artificial fruit doesn't seem to ever go bad. It's just always there, right? But it sure tastes terrible. And it doesn't do anything. All it is is for looking. And I'll tell you, we have manufactured fruit in our lives, and we can make it look really good. I can be good and gentle and kind and all of these things that every person thinks I ought to be and that, that I'm, uh, I can be a good representation of myself. But let me tell you, behind that fruit is the fake self-deceit that we bring as a human being. It's only when that genuine fruit of the Holy Spirit is seen that we really see that there is effective ministry for the Lord. And uh, we need to do a regular self-check to see if we're manifesting the gentleness and goodness of the Spirit this week. And I believe this morning, if you sit here today and you say, Pastor, I remember this week, there were some times that I did not manifest gentleness and goodness in my relationships or my interactions. Let me tell you here, I'm not going to sit here and condemn. We're not going to sit here and condemn, but I'm going to sit here and say, I'm going to stand here and say, that's an indication that we're not walking in the Spirit. May God help us to walk in the Spirit this week that we might not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And we might be able to see the fruits of the Spirit. Well, I don't know, you know, that fruit takes a long time. No, if you're walking in the Spirit today and I have an interaction and the Holy Spirit deals with me, I know exactly what to do right now. The fruit is seen. It's a wonderful thing. Ephesians 2.10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And then Romans 8, 9, we'll talk about this this morning. But you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And then Galatians 5, 16, this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So this morning, church, it's not a lesson on how to be gentle and good. It's when we are walking in the Spirit and are gentle and good, this is what it'll look like. So the question is, does your life match up with that today? Do your experiences match that? Have you had that experience of walking in the, in the spirit versus the flesh and that we can have victory in? And my challenge to you this week is that we would make that a priority. How do you, how we walk in the spirit? Can I just give you a quick three point lesson? Know that you are dead in Christ. Number two, understand that the flesh has no victory over you, no power over you. And number three, yield yourself to the Spirit. Lord, what do you want me to do today? How do I respond in this situation? I'm standing in this line, and I'm the one that's holding everybody up. Do I get impatient, unkind? Holy Spirit, what do I need to do here? Right? Or maybe you're the person behind the person who's holding everybody up. <laughs> Come on! <sighs> Breathing all the oxygen out of the room turning around saying, you know, rolling your eyes at people. You know how it is. And that makes me so uncomfortable when people do that. They want me to enter into their impatience, right? Just look around like I have nothing to do. <laughs> Let's walk in the Spirit, shall we?